morning, Compassion Church. Come on, stand to your
darkness running out of an empty grave now seated alone in glory enthroned on the highest place and you sent the darkness running out of an empty grave now seated alone in glory enthroned on the highest place oh you sent the darkness running out of an empty Amen. Can we do that? Can we worship from a place of remembrance and gratitude? Yeah, you can give it up to Jesus today. He's so good. Come on, what has he done for you? He saved my life. Amen. He saved Sean's life. Jeremy, he saved Jeremy's life. He saved, saved Kyle's life. He saved all of our lives. So when we think about who Jesus is, yes, he's wonderful, amazing, incredible, holy. No one compares to him, but also he saved our lives. So when we think about that, 
I just want us to to worship from a place of remembrance and gratitude never forgetting what the Lord has done for you what the Lord has done for your family what the Lord has done for your marriage amen may we never forget what the Lord has done and when we remember that man we can't help but lift our hands but scream but run but dance we can't help but do those things we can't help but say thank you Jesus we're so glad that you've joined us today God has been moving and speaking it has been a really great Sunday and he's not finished and so we just want to welcome you and if you have a need in just a moment we're gonna pray and we want to encourage you to come down and let someone pray with you amen you are not alone the enemy's gonna try to tell you differently but I'm here to tell you you are not alone you can look around and you can see your church family and you can feel and know something's different about this place. The Spirit of God is here in this place. And he wants to remind you that you're never alone. So Jesus, I pray right now that you would touch every heart, every need represented in this house. God, that you would move in our prayer team, God. That you would touch every life. God, remind them that you are for them and never against them. God, do a work in this place. Heal. Mend broken hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
shed his blood to prove to us the Father's love. Jesus Christ, be lifted up. Holy, holy Lamb of God, anointed one who was in me. shed his blood to prove to us the Father's love. Jesus Christ, be lifted up. Who else is worthy? Oh, who else is worthy? There is no Only Jesus. Who else is worthy? Who else? And who else is worthy? Church, you may be seated.
Well, hey, Compassion, how we doing this morning? Oh, no, mm -mm, start over. Start. Uh, how we doing this morning? God is good. He deserves all our praise, all our adoration, all the things because God is so good. We're excited to be in the house of the Lord today. And something I'm always excited about is getting to meet new family members. So we need to give it up for our first time guests. Let's give it up for them this morning. I love meeting new people. Even though, you know, sometimes it's hard to strike up a conversation, but it's just exciting to see that God is moving in our city. And so when we get to introduce somebody else to the family, it's so great. Even though we're a big crazy family, like I said last service, I'm the crazy uncle. We all need a crazy uncle in the family, you know, but we're super excited that you're here and we want to get to know you. And there's multiple ways we can get to know you. There's this orange card that's in the seat back in front of you. Fill it out, and if you don't have a pen, that's okay. There's a QR code back there. Scan it with your phone. Fill it out online, and then after service, there's an orange VIP tent outside. We want to greet you with a high five, fist bump, hug, whatever you're comfortable with, and we want to say welcome to the family. And we got a special gift just for you today for joining us to worship God. So let's give it up for them one more time. So we're going to transition another way of worship. That's with His tithes and our offerings. And then once I'm done with the offerings stuff. My amazing students and I are going to go upstairs. We're going to dive into the word a little bit more of what we talked about last Wednesday. So if you're a junior high or high school student, we'll meet in the back. And then after I'm dismissed, then we'll go up there and we'll just dig into the word and eat some donuts. So anyways, I was reading the Bible. I know some of you are like, Travis can read. Yes, I can read a little bit. My wife does most of it. But anyways, it's really cool because we're reading the Bible. We're trying to do it in a year. So we're reading it in chronological order. And so it's talking about different things. And I know sometimes the Bible can get confusing. There's a lot of big words in there. I'm not good with big words. My wife is. But anyways, we got to the point in Leviticus where it talks about all the different kinds of offerings. Because I believe that a lot of us think of offering as just one thing, one way, only one thing to do. But the cool thing about God, what I saw in that is he gives everybody an opportunity and what that is, is he gives it whatever you specialize in, is he said, here's a way that you can bring this offering. Because he wants us to put our best efforts into all of it. And so he knows that we're not all good at the same thing. He doesn't expect the same thing from each and, one of, each and every one of us. So what he does is he lays out different ways for people. Back in the day, a lot of people had farms. They had different farms. Wheat farms, cow farms, chicken farms, lamb farms, mixed farms, whatever. Every single one of those, he said, this is how you are to bring your offering to the house. I was like, man, that's really cool that our God doesn't just expect everybody to do the same exact thing. He finds out what you're good at, and he said, this is what I want you to bring. And so he wants us to bring the best of the best to him because he wants to give us his best all the time. So I encourage you, whatever that is, ask God, pray to God, read the Bible. God, what am I supposed to do? What, even if you don't know what you're good at. God will let you know what that thing is. And he said, this is how you are to bring it to the house. So I encourage you today, don't just think it's one way and one way only. God has something specific for you to bring to the house, to bring to that, because he wants to bless you in so many different ways. So again, there's multiple ways you can give. You can give in the bucket, you can text to give, you can give online, you can mail in a check, whatever you feel comfortable with. But ask God, God, what is it that you want me to bring to you? What is my best that I can bring to you today. So let's pray over this. Father God, thank you so much again for letting us come to worship you in every way, God, with everything that do with our voices, with our, with our claps, whatever it is, God, we thank you for the opportunity to come to your house and just to give you worship. God, we pray that you will open our eyes, that you will open our hearts, our minds, whatever it is, and let us know what it is that we're supposed to bring to you because we want to bring you the best of the best, God, because we know you deserve that and you're gonna give us the best in return and we praise you for that. So we pray you bless this offering, that you multiply it, that you bless the giver and that you will bless somebody else that doesn't even know that they need it today. And it's in your holy name that we pray, amen and amen. What's up, students? Just want to remind y'all that every Wednesday, midweek, Wichita Falls meets here at the church. Doors open at 630. Service starts at 7. We're done about 8, 815. I want y'all to come hang out with us, dive into the Word of God, get to meet new students and also our leaders and stuff, because it's just a great opportunity here at the church. And I want to get to meet y'all. I want to get to see y'all's lives being changed. So don't miss out. We love y'all. Can't wait to see y'all Wednesdays. Y'all have an awesome week.
Well, good morning. Hope everybody doing. It's great to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. So as we continue our sermon series, Undefendable, I'm going to do what I did the first week, and I'm going to make a disclaimer. If you're in here, you're going to be offended. Let's just get it out in the open. We're just going to be offended before it's over. It's just a strong possibility before you leave today, you're going to be offended. I just want to put it out there. So some of you may need to help your next door neighbor sitting next to you and help them not be offended today, but... More than likely, I don't know about you, but as we started this sermon series about being unoffendable, I've been offended. I've had, I've had some struggles and some stuff that was down deep inside of me that I didn't realize was there. I've had to deal with it, and I, I hope, and my prayer is, you're doing the same thing, because all that means is we're getting closer to God. And that is our ultimate goal, is to get closer to God. Amen? Today, I want to I start out with a statement, and that statement is this, and a concept is this. I don't want to offend you, but maybe, maybe you haven't said those, those words before. Maybe you haven't put it that way. I, I don't want to offend you, but maybe you've said some things like this. I don't want to put this the wrong way, but anybody? Uh, I'm sorry I offended you, but hey, don't take this the wrong way. But have you lost weight since the last time I saw you? You, you just call me fat. There's no other way to take that, right? You're like, oh, no, it's a compliment. No, it's not a compliment. I'm not trying to be racist, but. I'm not trying to be nosy, but. Oh, they don't want to hear this, but. I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but man, you're brave wearing that out in public. These ladies know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all looked at the other person, y'all gave them the butt. You're like, eh, yeah. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings, but do you need a breath mint? I'm not trying to gossip, but bless their heart. Sunday, Sunday, there's some Sunday. This has happened after preaching. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings, but I really like such and such. You know, Stephen or Joel or those guys, they preach really good. Don't you agree? What you mean? What are you saying to me? I know. Rude. I don't want to offend you, but. In 1 Corinthians 13 says this. It says, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. So my question for you today and for me today, and I want, I'm asking this question because I'm in the same boat with you. I'm, getting, I'm, I'm wanting to get closer to Christ. So my question for us today is this, how big is your unoffendable butt? How big is your undefendable butt? Father, I thank you today for allowing your words to come alive to us. Father, I pray that you'll just, you'll just help us. You'll help us become more like you. Help us not walk out of here offended, but more, walk, help us walk out of here unoffendable more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you haven't said those specific words, I don't want to offend you, but you've said variations of those words one way or another. You fell in that group up there. You fell in that category. Like I said, I'm coming for everybody today, so just get ready, right? So we've all said one of those forms. I don't want to offend you, but we've all said those, and we've all said them either to offend somebody, or we've said them to hurt someone, or we've said them to get our point across. One or the other, we fall in those categories, and that's how we, we address things. But see, we as believers of Christ are called to rise above and take on the, and not take on the offense. We're to rise above that. We're called to be above offense. We're called to be unoffendable. Here's what it is. We know the scriptures tell us in Luke that offense will come. Offenses will come. We even heard that last week. Offenses will come. But here's the thing about offense. You don't have to remain in offense. Because if you remain in offense, they will root inside of your life. And if they root inside of you, they will produce a harvest. 
Today, we're going to spend a little time looking at a passage of Scripture, and it shows us the fundamental foundations of our Christianity. It shows us the character that we should be developing inside of us. It, it, helps us, help, it will help us become unoffendable. Do you know the very foundation of our, of our Christianity, the walk of Jesus, is that of grace and forgiveness? That's what it's all about, faith, grace and forgiveness. Forgiveness and grace is what we're supposed to be exuding. That's what we're supposed to be imitating. That's what we're supposed to be giving. So as we look at Matthew chapter 18, you can go ahead and turn your Bibles there. That's where we're going to land, phones, whatever you do. They'll put the scriptures up. But we're going to be in Matthew 18 today, starting in verse 21. It says this, but Peter, or then Peter, came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brothers or sisters? Now I want you to pay attention. If you notice through this entire sermon series, we've been talking about brothers and sisters. That's you and me. If we're in Christ, we're brothers and sisters. We ain't talking about the world. We're not talking about people who don't know Jesus. We're not talking about out there. We're talking about in here, brothers and sisters. Amen? Look at somebody and say, you're my brother. And that's weird if they were your sister. But look at them and say, if they're your sister, tell them you're a sister. Right? If you're in Christ, you are a brother or sister. And some of you are like, you're married, and you're like, that's really weird, right? <laughs> that's a whole different sermon. But that's what, here's where brothers and sisters in Christ. So as we look at this right here, it specifically tells us, and he says, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brothers or sister who sin against me? Up to seven times? That's, here's Peter talking. And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. See, Peter, was, Peter thought he was going to get some brownie points with Jesus. He thought, man, I'm going to be the top uh, disciple. Watch this, guys. Because in the Jewish co culture, the rabbis taught that you were to forgive three times. And after three times, you're out of here. Boy, I'd already been out of here a long time ago. Anybody else identify with that? Hey, Amen. So Jesus, I mean, Peter was like, hey, I'll go seven times. And Jesus was like, ha, 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 uh, watch this. 77 times. Matter of fact, he says, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. And the King James, if you have it, it says 70 times seven. If you look in the book of, Ma uh, the book of Luke, in Luke chapter 17, it says that you're to do it seven times daily. But here's the point. That number seven, the number seven is completeness or it's perfection. So it's not just simple, oh, I'm going to forgive you five, seven times or 77 times or 70 times seven. I'm not just forgiving you that. It's a place of completion. Here's the thing. You cannot be an unoffendable person by keeping score. You cannot be an unoffendable person by keeping score. You have to be a person who's losing count. If you're counting on how many times somebody offended you, you're missing the very thing that Jesus is trying to teach us. You're missing the very thing that he has called us to do as unoffendable men and women of God. And that is to forgive because that's what God did to us. He forgave us. He sent his only son to forgive us and give us grace. And we need that today. See, Jesus' blood on the cross was perfection. What this actually is saying to you and to me is that we need to forgive a person as often as they need to be forgiven. How many people in here today, you need forgiveness? Man, I need it all the time. I need his grace all the time because I'm a big mess up. And he's got to have grace on me and he's got to forgive me. See, many times what happens is we judge people by their actions, but we want to be judged by our intentions. You've probably heard that before, but that statement is so true. We judge other people by their actions, but we want them to judge us by our intentions. They did this, but that's not what I meant. You did mean it. I don't want to offend you, but how big is your unoffendable but? How big is that unoffendable but in your life? So over the next few minutes, as we're reading the story and we're looking through it, we're going to talk what we must develop inside of us to remain as, as an unoffendable Christian. And number one is this, unoffendable people have a character of forgiveness and grace in their life. Unoffendable people have a character of grace and forgiveness in their life. Matthew 18 says this, there, verse 23, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. 
At this, very, at this, the very servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. The first thing I want you to notice out of that, what a beautiful image this is, is that we have a loving God in heaven, a master in heaven, a king of kings, and the Lord of lords, and he forgave all of our debt. This is a very picture of forgiveness in our lives as we accepted Christ. That's what forgiveness is. That is what grace is. That's the, that's the biggest picture right there. He forgave us of our sins, and he canceled all of our debts. But I want to look at the scripture just a little bit different today. I want, to, I want to look at it through a different lens, if you will, for just a minute. And here's what I want to say is, as I was reading multiple commentaries, that the man who owed, he owed that 10,000. What that 10,000 bags of gold in today's society would be in the millions, maybe even trillion dollars. It was something that he could never pay back. It would cost him his entire lifetime to pay back those millions and trillions of dollars. So this debt that he owed, not only was it about to imprison him, not only was it about to put him in slavery, but it was about to put his wife in slavery and his children in slavery. When we don't forgive, it only places us in a place of slavery, of bitterness and hatred. And it does the same for our families. When you as a believer get to a place where you have unforgiveness in your heart and you're offended, you have a place of bitterness that starts to take root and you have a place of bitterness that starts and hatred begins and that takes root time and time again. I know so many people that have unforgiveness in their heart because of offense. That they've walked away from the church because they were offended. And more than important, more the, the sadder than walking away from the church is they walked away from God because they were offended or they were hurt. And unfortunately, the same happens with their children. Their children don't even know why they're offended, but they know the parents are offended, so they walk away from the church. They walk away from God. God has called us to have a character of grace and forgiveness. Continuing with verse 26, it says, At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. He said, be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. The servant begged his master, be patient with me and I will pay you back everything. I want you to pay attention to that phrasing and, and just keep it in your mind for a minute, that phrasing, what that servant said to his master. Pay attention to the attitude. He begged him to let him go. He pleaded with him. And by doing that, he was let go. So forgiveness and grace was given and he received his freedom. It's the same thing with you and with me. If we will freely give forgiveness and grace, we will receive freedom. It has no chains on us. It will not bound us in slavery. It has a place where we, have, we can walk and we will walk in freedom. I don't want to offend you today, but how big is your unoffendable butt? Number two, unoffendable people have a character of not holding grudges. Unoffendable people have a character of not holding grudges. Verse 28, Matthew says, but when the servant, when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Here's that wording. Be patient with me and I will pay, pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown in, into prison until he could pay the debt. Do you remember what Peter asked at the very beginning? The question he said, how many times should I forgive my brother or my sister who sinned against me? This servant who was just forgiven in front of the master, this servant who was just giving grace in front of him, evidently he doesn't remember that because he goes finds not his servant, but a fellow servant, someone right across from him, another Christian. He goes and finds him. He doesn't even ask him, will you repay me? He goes and grabs him up and starts choking him out. I'm just saying nowadays the fight's on, right? I'm choking me out. 
maybe, maybe, maybe I can put it a little more realistic for us. Let's just say, hypothetically, this has never happened here, of course. It's never happened at Compassion Church. Let's just say, one day, a group of people get together to worship in this church. We're going to say which one, but maybe here. They're worshiping. They're lifting their hands. They're feeling the spirit of God. It's moving. They're experiencing God. They're hearing an okay sermon. It's decent at best, you know. They're asking for forgiveness from God, and, and they're dealing with that stuff that they've messed up last week. They're, they're getting it all out, and man, they're feeling better. They're feeling closer to God, and as service ends, they walk outside, and they get into the parking lot, and they cuss somebody out. It's just like that servant. The first servant got forgiveness, was asked for forgiveness. The first servant got his, his forgiveness and was let go, got his freedom, but then he went and got his fellow servant. He forgot what was given to him. That's the same way it is with us. We come in here. We lift our hands. We worship. We get closer to God, and then we go out there. And as soon as we get out there, we start backbiting, or we start gossiping, or we start slandering, or we start, we start going at somebody who is our brother and sister in Christ. I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about how you're treating your brother and sister in Christ. You're holding grudges. I told you I'm coming for everybody today. I don't mean to offend you, but how big is your unoffendable butt? When does your butt change to be unoffendable to offendable? What is that line that you cross at that point? Maybe there's sometimes I can be where this doesn't bother me and it's not, it doesn't offend me, but there's a spot over here. You come at me now, I'm offended. What, what is that but spot for you? What is that place for you that crosses the line? See, many times we are offended by other people's issues, but not our own sin. Many times we are offended about other sins, but not our own pride. Many times we are offended by other people's outward expressions or their opinions, but not our inner, internal dialogue that goes on. Many times we are offended when, when we feel like people are treating us wrong, but we give ourselves grace for gossiping. See, we justify our offense and criticize others. Here's what's ironic about this story. This man owes millions and millions and trillions of dollars to the master. His fellow person, uh, everything I read, he owed about 20 bucks in the today, today's time. He owed him $20, but he's going to choke him out. He's going to grab him. He's going to get him thrown in prison because he's holding a grudge, because he's offended. For some reason... I relate to that first servant because sometimes I forgive how much I've been forgiven. And I got to remember, he's forgiving me much. And so because he's forgiving me much, I've got to give much forgiveness. You got to remember that he's forgiving you much. You got to give much forgiveness. There is not a place where you can, you can say, oh, I've just been forgiven a little. We've been, given, we've been forgiven a whole lot. Have you ever said... I'll forgive them, but you still hold a grudge. You may not say that outwardly, but you say it inwardly because there's conflict inside of you. You can't rest. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is my strength. And on the, and the reverse side of the joy of the Lord is my strength. The Bible tells us that, that a disheartened person, that it will dry up their bones. You ever met somebody that's been so depressed or so upset about being hurt that that person pretty much, they get sick. Even their immune system goes down. That's the word of God. That's what it's telling us. We've got to let go of offense. We got to not hold grudges anymore. We got to release that and walk like Christ. We got to put that character of forgiveness and grace inside of us. James 5 and 9 says, do not, don't grumble against one another. Brothers and sisters, did you hear that? He's talking to us again. Man, I wish the Bible wouldn't have been, I wish the Bible was written for other people and not for me. You know, I'm like, come on, me again? But he's saying brothers and sisters. He's saying you, me, me, and you. Do not grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. And pay attention to this. Look at how this is written the judge, capital J, is standing at the door. The judge, the God in heaven, 
the creator of everything, is standing at the door. Do not grumble against one another or you will be judged. If we can just remember that grace and forgiveness was given to us in the highest form, we should graciously forgive others. We should graciously forgive our brothers and our sisters in Christ. Because as I read the scripture a while ago, it says, love keeps no record of wrong. And how can we love somebody if all we do is keep a record of their wrongs? We cannot walk, in un walk unoffendable with having a but in our life. Scriptures tells us when you ask for forgiveness, God forgives you. And he no longer remembers that sin. He no longer remembers that. Matter of fact, he doesn't hold a grudge. He doesn't bring it back up in your past. He doesn't talk about his hard feelings, how he, you mistreated him, how I mistreated him. He wipes it out. When you say, please forgive me, it's wiped out. It's gone. But many times we have not forgiven, nor have we forgotten we hold a grudge. I don't want to offend you today, but... How big is your unoffendable butt? Number three, unoffendable people have a character, have character to be a witness. Unoffendable people have a character to be a witness. Verse 31, it says, when the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in, you wicked servant, he said, I canceled all of your debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have, mer had ha shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. Verse 31 really gets me. Verse 31 really grabs a hold of me because it says other servants saw what had happened. Here's what I want you to know, child of God. Here's what I wanted you to know, brother and sister walking in the faith with me. People are watching you. They are watching how you respond. They are watching how you forgive. They are watching how you extend grace. They are watching you because for them, they know you're a follower of Christ. They know that you're a Christian. What they are looking at is you should be exemplifying. You should be the example of Jesus here on earth to them. They're looking at you. It's a hard road to walk, but they are looking at you. Not perfection, but they're looking how did you respond. How do you respond at the drive through How do you respond on the fast lane and slow lane? How do you respond to the bill collectors? How do you respond to the door dashers? How do you respond to different people? How do you treat your fellow brothers and Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ in front of people? See, secondary offense... Secondary offense can be the hardest offense to forgive. And I wish I had more time about secondary offense because I want to show you something here in scriptures. There's a secondary offense that happens here. It could be the hardest. See, the first person may forgive, but the second person may not forgive as quickly. So that's the reason we're, we're not supposed to be sharing and gossiping and, and, and piling it on everybody else. And, but, but we're just venting, but we need to share it with somebody. It's clearly here. A secondary offense is harder to forgive. And we can see this right here because it says they were outra outraged. They were outraged. Have you been offended by, for someone? Have you ever had someone and you were offended for them? You may not have any dog in that hunt. You may not know, know the situation, but you are offended for them. You take on a secondary offense. And that secondary offense is very, very hard let me help. I'm going to help some couples here tonight. I'm going to, today, I'm going to help you, help you out for just a minute. If you're, you're a couple, you're married, uh, maybe, maybe you're in the future. If you're single and you're, you're thinking in the, in, you're going to get a spouse in the future, let me help you out. Let me help you with this right here. This is relationship advice 101. Never complain about your spouse to your parents. Never do it. Don't ever tell your parents about your spouse and how much you're mad. Because after you're done venting, after you're done mad, after you have moved on from telling them and spewing all that stuff on them, guess what? They still think about slashing the tires of your spouse. That's secondary offense. 
That's how secondary offense, they were outraged. And so they went and told the master. See, secondary offense is just as deadly to your soul as being offended. And why it's so deadly to your soul is just as much as being offended is because it is based on a skewed view of a person's offense. They're going to tell you their part of the story. They're going to tell you how it made them feel. They're going to share with you. So you don't have all the facts. You just have an offended perspective. It's a dangerous place to happen because what will happen, they will move on, but you're offended for them. So what is inside of you will remain and get rooted and it will bring a harvest on you. Here, they're happy-go-lucky, already forgave the person, moving on. But because you took on a secondary offense, now it's draining all things out of you. This may be the very reason that Ephesians chapter 4, it says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. Did you hear that? Not according to your needs, help building up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Did you hear? Those who listen. There was a, there in this story, this parable he's telling us, there was a person out there listening how the first servant was treating the second servant. They're listening to us. They're hearing us. How are we treating one another? Are we holding grudges? Or do we forgive and give grace? And it continues to say, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all. He didn't say a little bit. He didn't say partial. You can keep 50-50. He said get rid of all. Say all with me. All. I just want to make sure you're awake today. Bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. You say, but they deserve it. You don't know what they did to me. They lied. They said this. They gossiped. They treated me wrong. They harmed me physically. You're right. I don't know what it is. I'm not telling you can't be offended. I'm telling you you can't remain offended. You can't remain in it. you got to give it up. you got to become an unoffendable person. Because for Christ... It says, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. There is no option two. There's no plan B to this. The scriptures are very clear and it says what? Forgive. Romans 14, 13 says, therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacles in the way of a brother or sister. Once again, he's talking to us. Some of us need that big, here's your sign in neon with a chain that walks around our neck in the bedroom, above the bed, in the mirror. You've got to forgive. You cannot be an offendable person and walk in, in, in the life of, like, walk li life of Christ. You have to be an unoffendable person. As we're closing today, I want to look at the last verse in Matthew chapter 18, verse 35. He says, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. You got to forgive them from your heart. You can't just say I'm forgiving them and then hold a grudge. It will not build the character of forgiveness and grace because you will hold, you will hold a grudge and you will keep an account of everything that they have ever done. For years and years, I have been taught, and as I've, I've been in the ministry, they, 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 it, it is true. There is, they said there's one sin, and that's blasphemy, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit that is a sin that's unforgivable. But I'm telling you today, I think there may be a second sin. And we can see it right here in scriptures. It says, Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But, here's the but. Here's the unoffendable but. This is the line. Offense, unoffendable. Here's the but. But if you do not forgive others their sin, your Father will not forgive your sins. It is not an option. It's not a maybe. There's no gray. You have to forgive as a follower of Christ. 
It really doesn't matter how big the bud is in, in your offense. Just as in this parable, the first servant, because of unforgiveness, he held a grudge for some reason, whatever it is, whatever his butt was. But when his master found out, there was punishment to come along. He came back, the master came back and put him, had him tortured and had him put in prison until he could pay off his debts. I don't want to offend you today, but... How big is your unoffendable butt? I'll forgive, but if they do this to me, I'll forgive, but there's no buts in forgiveness. None with being a follower of Jesus Christ. You have to forgive. First Corinthians 13 says it once again, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrong. You got to get let go of the records. You got to let go of what they did in the past. You got to let go of all the things they, that happened, whether they did it physically, whether they did it mentally, whether they did it verbally, you got to let go of it. Love keeps no records of wrong. And us as unoffendable Christians, we can't keep wrong. We can't keep any records of wrongs. It says it does not keep record of wrongs. Love does not delight, delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Love never fails. We have to be an unoffendable Christian. There is no choice. We have to forgive and give grace. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Today, if you've been holding a grudge, I want to pray for you. You go, man, I got a grudge. I've been holding a grudge. Is that anybody? Raise your hand. If you got grudges, man, hands all over. I've got my hand up. Father, I pray for, for all of us. I pray right now that you would deliver us from those grudges. You would help us become forgivers. You'd help us give grace, Father, just as much as you gave it to us. You forgave us on that cross for all of our sins, all of our debt. You washed it away, and I'm praying right now, Father, you would wash our, wash our hearts and our minds. Father, I pray you would take, have our minds being taken captive, and we would think on those things that are wholesome, that we would have love, that we would love and we keep no records of wrong anymore. Maybe today, maybe today you, you, you say, man, I have a butt in my life. And I want that out of there because I want to walk in full forgiveness. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand, hands all over the place. Father, I pray for everyone that we have an excuse as why we're to be offended or how we can be offended. I pray for us right now that you would wash, our, wash it clean. Father, give us a new slate. Give us forgiveness. Give us the, the freedom, Father. Don't help us not to, to put ourselves into slavery or chain ourselves together. Help us, Father, to be free and freely forgive our brothers and sisters in Christ and help us forgive the world and help us be a better witness to them. We're claiming those things. Last question I have for you today. If you don't know Jesus Christ, your personal Lord and Savior, all you have to do is admit that you're a sinner, believe that he is the Son of God and he rose on the third day, confess him Lord of your life. If that's you today and you go, I want to accept Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior, will you just lift your hand? Is there anyone in here today that says, I don't want to walk out of here without knowing Jesus? Is there anybody today? I see one two, there's three, there's four, anyone else. Today's the day of salvation. You're not here by accident. There's four hands. Put your hands together for Jesus today. Welcome to the family of God. We're all going to say the sinner's prayer together, but let me encourage you this. If you raise your hand today and you're, you're giving your life to Jesus today, uh, we've got two people in the back. I think I see uh, Tammy and Eddie. I see them back there, or Joe and Eddie. They want to meet with you for just a second just to talk to you about your next step after giving your heart to Jesus, which is baptism. It'll just take a minute. Stop with them and have a conversation with them, and they're going to lead you. But first of all, I want us all to pray with our new family members in Christ. Let's all pray this prayer. Say, Jesus. I invite you into my heart. I invite you into my life. Please forgive me of all my sins and all my ways. I repent and ask you to be the Lord and Savior of my life forever and ever. Amen. Put your hands together for Jesus. We are so happy that you joined us today. Here at Compassion, we value family, which means we value you. 
If there's any way that we can be praying for you and believing with you for something, please make sure that you let us know. You guys have a great week and we'll see you here next Sunday.